Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon from wherever you are. Um, we're still having some participants trickling in, but we're going to get started with the introductions. Um, this is a Glow Durham Training Committee uh, webinar. My name is Carlin. I am a medical student at the University of Emory uh, or Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia in the United States. Um, but I'm currently on a research fellowship in Lima, Peru. Um, today, we have a really amazing talk lined up for you uh, called New Frontiers in the Treatment of Acne with two speakers, uh, Dr. Galadari and Dr. Ashkanani. So we're going to just have a couple of intro slides about um, Glowderm, and then we'll have invite the speakers to, um, to give their talk. So um, Luisa wasn't able to make it today, but as I said, I'm Carlin and I'm from the U.S. Um, so who are the Glowderm Training Committee? Committee. So uh, the Glowderm International Alliance for Global Health Dermatology, we have as a part of that, we have a training committee and there will be some info shared about our group in the chat if you have any interest in learning more. And our mission is to promote knowledge equity by improving access to education for dermatology trainees across the world. Um, and as a part of this, just like this webinar is hoping to achieve, we aim to provide free educational events and opportunities to build networks uh, and collaborate across the world. So um, for this webinar, your audio is muted and your camera is turned off. Um, so if you have any questions or comments, please share them via the chat function um, or the Q&A, either one, and we'll be moderating them throughout the, the talk. Um, we are going to ask, you can put your questions in the chat or the Q&A um, throughout the hour, but we will hold off on asking the speakers these questions until the end. So feel free to send them whenever uh, you, you have the question, or if you want to wait till the end, that's fine too. Um, so here are our two speakers today for the New Frontiers in the Treatment of Acne. Uh, Dr. Galadari is an Associate Professor of Dermatology at the College of Medicine and Health Sciences of the United Arab Emirates University, and Dr. Ashkanani is an Assistant Registrar in the Ministry of Health Kuwait. Um, and this, this webinar is being recorded, and if you have any more interest in learning about the Glowderm Training Committee or the Glowderm Alliance, the, our social media tags are in the bottom right corner as well, um, and feel free to um, tweet or put any posts on the Instagram story if there's anything that really speaks to you during this talk. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Again, um, feel free to put your questions in the chat in the Q&A, and we will get to them at the end. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and um, hand it over to the first speaker, Dr. Ashkanani. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. All right, can everyone hear me? Looks good. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Hassan Ashkanani. I'm uh, an assistant registrar in the Ministry of Health Kuwait. Uh, I'll be giving uh, this talk today uh, in collaboration with Glowderm and Dr. Galadari. The talk will be titled New Frontiers in the Treatment of Acne. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest when it comes to this talk. So today we'll be going through uh, an introduction about acne, talking about the pathophysiology. Then I'll be talking about some contributing factors to acne. And then I'll be briefly touching on the clinical presentation and treatment of acne. Uh, the treatment part will be mainly handled by Dr. Galadari, but I'll be touching on it briefly. And at the end, we'll be doing some clinical cases uh, as examples. So uh, what is acne? What we commonly term as acne is uh, acne vulgaris. Uh, it's a very common disease of the pilosebaceous unit. Uh, it affects the susceptible hair follicles, commonly affecting uh, the face, neck, and upper back. Uh, it is the most co uh, commonly encountered skin condition in adolescents and young adults. Uh, around 80%, 85% uh, of the people present with acne at some point in their life. 
uh, the incidence usually peaks between the ages of 12 to 35, and it becomes uh, marked during puberty uh, due to the influence of the endocrine glands and the pilosebaceous units. Uh, it is usually worse during fall and in the winter. Um, acne affects both genders equally. So what is the pathophysiology of acne? Uh, when we talk about the pathophysiology, there are three dominant uh, factors that lead to acne. Uh, each person has one thing more dominant than the other, but it's usually a conjunction of the three uh, processes. Uh, so for the first process is uh, follicular hyperkeratosis. Uh, this occurs uh, due to deficiency in linoleic acid, or, or more commonly known as vitamin F. Uh, it usually provides uh, moisture and plumpness to the skin, but deficiency in this uh, acid has been uh, shown to be a contributing factor to acne. Uh, there is also the effect of dihydrotestosterone, and we'll be talking about it more later. Uh, these two factors uh, lead to follicular hyperkeratosis, uh, which is the first process. Uh, the second process that causes acne is uh, the androgenic stimulation of the sebaceous glands. This usually occurs during pu uh, puberty, and this causes enlargement in the sebaceous glands, uh, which leads to an increase in sebum production. Uh, in turn, uh, the sebum uh, rises to the top of the hair follicle and seeps into the skin surface. So when this occurs, uh, the, se the sebum accumulates in the pilosebaceous unit and it causes plugging of the pilosebaceous unit. Uh, this causes uh, the appearance of comedones in the skin. So uh, the third process uh, that leads to acne is colonization uh, with a bacterium called QT bacterium acne, prop, uh, previously known as propion bacterium acne. Uh, this is uh, the anaerobic bacterium uh, that, is, uh, that has been observed to be responsible for causing acne. So how does this bacterium lead to acne production? Uh, this bacterium colonizes the skin and then it secretes two things, lipases and uh, exozymes or exoenzymes. So the lipases act on the sebaceous lipids. Uh, these sebaceous lipids uh, release fatty acids and peptides. When these two things are released, uh, polymorphs and lymphocytes are produced. And when polymorphs and lymphocytes are produced, this causes inflammation. So uh, when inflammation occurs, uh, some hydrolytic enzymes are released. And and then these hydrolytic enzymes uh, uh, interact with the exozyme produced by the QT bacterium acne, and this causes rupture of the follicular wall. And then <laughs> once the follicular wall uh, ruptures, uh, this damage causes inflammatory skin, uh, inflammatory cells, mainly interleukin-1 and TNF-alpha to be released. Uh, when these are released, this causes prostaglandin-like uh, substance, amino acids, and short-chain short chain fatty acids to be released, which causes uh, further inflammation. Uh, this uh, mechanism is mainly responsible for the production of the inflammatory part of the acne, which I'll be talking about in a bit. So patients with acne commonly present uh, with a polymorphic skin eruption. Uh, this polymorphic skin eruption is usually caused by comedones. Uh, these comedones are the end process or the end result of the follicular plugging. So they can be open comedones, which are commonly known as blackheads, or closed comedones, which are commonly known as whiteheads. So uh, blackheads occur, uh, why, why, why are they called blackheads? Um, the, when you see the skin, uh, it looks black. But this, uh, this black color is not due to dirt. It's due to the oil of the pilosebaceous unit uh, oxidizing when it reaches the surface of the skin. This does not occur in closed or white heads. Uh, there are also some inflammatory papules, pustules, nodules, cysts, and scars. Uh, anything that is not a comedone is a part of the inflammatory process of the acne. Uh, so we all know what papules are, we all know what pustules are. Uh, pustules usually occur on top of the papules, so they are commonly present 
or patients commonly present with what we call papillopustular eruption. Uh, they can also present with some nodules. So these are under the skin. They are commonly painful. And the sizes usually reach uh, one to four centimeters. Uh, there are also some cysts that may occur. And uh, the end result of acne is sometimes scarring. Uh, so for the severity part, how do we uh, grade acne based on severity? Uh, there are four. Uh, well, four levels of severity. The first one, uh, grade one, which is commonly called comedonal acne. So these patients just present only with comedones. They have no papules, no pustules, no scars, nothing. So this is the first level, uh, T1. And then the second level of the severity or grade two, uh, this is the mild acne. So mild acne is mild comedonal uh, presentation with some papules and little scarring. Then we go up in the scale uh, for moderate acne or grade three. Uh, these patients present with comedones, papules, some pustules and moderate scarring. And then we have the final grade, which is severe acne or what we commonly call nodulocystic acne. These patients present with severe nodulocystic acne and marked scarring can occur. So uh, this is the pathogenesis. Uh, it's basically a summary of what I just said. Uh, it starts as microcomedones, and then it goes to comedones, inflammatory papules and pustules, then nodules. So these pictures are some common presentations. Uh, to the left, we have a mix of open and closed comedones. You can see these are the closed comedones. Uh, the picture in the middle uh, shows some inflammatory acne. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, we have uh, some papules, some pustules, and some scarring. And then uh, the picture to the right is the severe form of acne, or what we call nodulocystic acne. You can see some nodules and some cysts under the skin, in addition to some remarked scarring. So what are some contributing factors uh, to patients with acne? Uh, the first one is genetics. Uh, studies showed that there is uh, patients who have relatives who have acne are 81% more likely to get acne during their lifetime. Uh, in addition to genetics, diets. So there has always been, uh, throughout my medical training, it was always uh, diet causes acne, never mind diet doesn't cause acne. So uh, there, it was always a point of contention. Uh, but now what literature says is that diets uh, with high glycemic index and uh, dairy products are the two main uh, dietary factors associated with acne. Uh, Dr. Galadari will talk more about that. But in summary, a diet with high glycemic index causes an increase in the insulin-like growth factor, which affects the endocrine processes. And... For the dairy, it was shown that skimmed milk uh, is most associated with acne, and that's due to the contents in it, uh, mainly the whey and the casein. Uh, there is also uh, associate, association uh, between stress and acne. Uh, patients usually present with acne flare-ups uh, during stressful periods, and uh, there is also association with some cosmetics. So what we commonly call uh, comedonal or uh, comedogenic cosmetics. Uh, these are the, the thick layers of uh, cosmetics that cause that contribute to the follicular plugging. Uh, there are also some medical conditions uh, that were uh, seen to be associated with acne. Uh, XYY syndrome is associated with the severe nodulocystic acne. Uh, Hydradenitis suppurativa is associated with acne. Uh, patients usually present with uh, hydradenitis suppurativa, acne, and uh, pyelonidal sinus. This is what we commonly call uh, the follicular plugging syndrome. Uh, it is also associated with pityriasis rubra pilaris and lichen spinulosis. So uh, what are some other forms of acne? Uh, it is not just the acne vulgaris that we commonly see. Uh, patients sometimes present with Neonatal acne, this is very self-explanatory. It is acne that occurs in the neonates. 
It is usually due to glandular development, and it is uh, very transient and self-limiting. Uh, there is usually no treatment required for this. There is also acne mechanica. It occurs due to the mechanical thugging of the hylostabaceous unit. So usually we see it in patients who, let's say, put their hands on their chin for a while. They develop acne in this area. So this is mechanical thugging. There's also acne excoriae, which usually more commonly affects younger girls. Uh, it is associated with psychological factors. It is acne that flares up during stress. And there has been uh, an association with uh, mental illness, uh, namely of uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, there are also acne conglobata. Acne conglobata is, uh, let's say, a very, very, very severe form of acne. Patients present with severe nodulocystic acne. Uh, it affects younger uh, boys, and uh, it can occur in the lower back and the buttocks. So these patients present more with acne in these areas. Uh, and there is acne fulminans. It is acne that is associated with fever uh, and arthralgia and uh, elevated leukocytes. So when we see a patient coming with these features, leukocytosis, uh, we have to think about acne fulminans. And finally, there are the acne form eruptions. Uh, there are multiple causes to acne form eruptions, uh, but I chose to talk about medications. Uh, there are some medications that lead to, uh, we can call it a drug eruption uh, that manifests as an acne form eruption. Uh, these medications include uh, anti-epileptics, uh, some steroids, patients who we can see the patients who frequent the gym, uh, take some supplements, uh, some steroids. Uh, they present with an eruption that looks like acne, but there is one main difference. Uh, the main difference is that this acne is non-comedonal. We try to look for comedones and there is nothing. So when we see uh, these presentations, we have to think of an acne form eruption. Uh, so for, for an evaluation of patients with acne, there are some things we have to think about. Uh, first, uh, we ask this patient, did you try any treatments before? Uh, what treatments did you try and did they work for you? Uh, what are the current products that you are using, if they are using any products? Uh, we ask them about any medical issues, any hormonal problems. Uh, for females, we ask if they have the symptoms of uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, as uh, this can uh, cause an acne eruption. Uh, so we ask them about the symptoms, uh, hirsutism, uh, some menstrual uh, irregularities, and so on. Uh, what are the medications that they are taking if we are suspecting a drug eruption? Uh, also, use of cosmetics or hair pomade. So, so uh, some hair products uh, can lead to the formation of acne due to the mechanical plugging. Uh, we call this pomade acne. They usually present with acne mainly on the forehead area and around the temples. So the areas where, that are close to where the hair products is going. Uh, there are all, we can also ask for females. As I said, we ask for hirsutism, menstrual history, and uh, OCPs. OCPs can lead to drug eruptions. So what are, what are the treatments of acne? Uh, this part will be mainly handled by Dr. Galadari. Uh, but in summary, we have some topical treatments, uh, some, we can use benzoyl peroxide as like acid, retinoids, antibiotics, all with their own indications and uh, recommendations. Uh, there are also some systemic medications, so antibiotics, retinoids, or hormonal treatments. Uh, we could use chemical peels and lasers. So now I'll be uh, giving some cases and talking about them. So the first case we have is a 15-year-old female. She presents to the clinic with a three-month history of bumps on the face. So when seeing this presentation, uh, we first history, then we describe the lesion, and then uh, we give our diagnosis and management plan. So this patient presented with multiple closed comedones, so whitehead, as well as a few two to three inflammatory papules on the face. All of these lesions were less than five, cent, uh, five millimeters in diameter. And then we asked some questions about the history. Uh, the patient had a diet with high glycemic index, 
uh, and the patient had family members who had acne as well. There were no medications that the patient was taking that were that were pointing us towards any alternative uh, diagnosis. So what is our diagnosis for this case? It is mild or grade one acne. So for uh, Dr. Galadari, we'll be talking about the, we'll be giving a very good algorithm uh, on how to treat each uh, grade of acne. But basically the guidelines state that for mild or grade one acne, uh, it is recommended to give topical retinoids, benzoyl peroxide or azelaic acid uh, for the best uh, efficacy in comedonal acne. Uh, so this patient, we decided to give him a benzoyl peroxide wash. It was an initial treatment. Uh, we told him to use this, come back to us in one month and we will assess uh, the improvement. Uh, so some over-the-counter uh, concentrations are available, 5% uh, gel, 10% wash. Uh, the higher you go in the percentage, the more efficacious it is. However, uh, there is a larger uh, room for, let's say, uh, side effects and skin irritation. Uh, so this was the first case. The patient came one month later, and he was, uh, she was completely improved, and we didn't even need any follow. So our second case. Our second case is a 26-year-old female who presented to our clinic with a three-year history of red bumps on the face and back. Uh, the patient tried different treatments before, including topical creams, uh, antibiotic tablets, but there was no resolution of her condition. So this was the patient on presentation. Uh, the left picture is her face, the right picture is her back. Uh, so as we can clearly see, it is a very, very severe form of acne. The patient has some nodules, some cysts, and uh, it's a very marked inflammation and scarring uh, both in the face and back. So this patient has multiple inflammatory, multiple inflammatory lesions presenting as papules, pustules, nodule uh, in the face and uh, back, as well as some scarring and post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Uh, the same questions were asked in the history, uh, diet, uh, medications, and uh, family uh, members of the family presenting with the same condition. So this patient had grade four. It was nodulocystic acne with marked scarring. Uh, since this patient started on uh, topical treatments uh, and antibiotics, uh, she was asked about the compliance and whether she was using the medications correctly. Uh, she confirmed that she was using it as instructed and being compliant. So after failure of these two forms of treatment, uh, we go to, to our end result, which was uh, starting, her, uh, starting her on oral isotretinoin. So prior to starting patients on oral isotretinoin, uh, some things have to be established. Uh, we need some baseline labs. We need to make sure that the patient is not pregnant. Uh, we need to consult the patient about the side effects of isotretinoin and we need to emphasize uh, the teratogenicity of isotretinoin. Uh, some, side of, some common side effects are dryness and the face and mucous membrane. Some epistaxis can occur. Uh, chapped lips is uh, the most common side effect. There are some other side effects like night blindness. Uh, some eruptions may occur during the first month. Uh, and uh, the fact that Taking oral isotretinoin, patients need to make sure that they do not take tetracycline. These two medications used together can lead to uh, the condition called uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So it causes the, an increase in the intracranial pressure, which can cause some neurological symptoms. Uh, so we took some baseline labs, CBC, uh, a complete blood count, uh, renal and liver function, and the PIT profile. Uh, the patient was told uh, it is important not to get pregnant. Uh, the fact that some lipids may rise, mainly the triglycerides, uh, it could be up to a 25% rise in the lipids. And the uh, patient did a beta HCG test and she was not pregnant. She signed a consent form and she was started on oral isotretinoin. Uh, so the dosing of oral isotretinoin, we usually go with a cumulative dose. So we see the patient's weight. 
and uh, based on the weight, we do a maximum or uh, we take an average uh, based on the condition and severity of the dosage that will be given. For this patient, it was decided that she would be given uh, 150 milligrams. And when cal calculating the cumulative dose, it was uh, 8,250 milligrams. So uh, I, we gave the patient some options. Uh, we could go with a lower dose, so lower side effects, but longer duration of treatment, or higher dose, more possibility of side effects. And the side effects would be managed, of course, as they write. Uh, the patient chose uh, to go at a, a daily dose of 30 milligrams for 90. Uh, labs were obtained initially every month for the first four months. Uh, we observed for the change in liver and adrenal functions, as well as some, uh, any change in the lipids. Uh, thankfully, no side effects were encountered. There were only uh, some, some dryness in the lips and the eyes. She was given uh, some moisturizing lip balm for the lips and some eye drops for the eye. But otherwise, uh, there were no other side effects, thankfully. Uh, as I said, the labs were taken uh, initially monthly uh, for the first four months. And then we took them every two months. Uh, and the patient continued until she finished uh, all of her dose. So the next picture will show you this is the patient at every single uh, month. So we started at two months. You could see, I'll go back to the picture of presentation. You could see that even at two months, you see how bad her uh, condition was, uh, how bad the inflammation was. There were some active lesions. At two months, uh, as early as that time, you could see a, re a, a remarkable improvement. Uh, her skin looks like it, it was calming down. Uh, she was facing uh, less new eruptions. She, she, she would say every week she would have one to two new lesions, uh, when in the past they were five to six by daily. And then we continued following her up, and you can see a remarkable improvement until her face were almost, uh, was almost clear at uh, nine months. So I, I'm personally very biased to oral isotretinoin. Uh, but there are some new medications in the market, and um, Dr. Galadari will be talking about that, that produce excellent results as well. So we'll be going to the third case now. Uh, our third case is an 18-year-old obese female who presented with a two-year history of unclear face. Uh, the first thing that was marked, uh, female, 18-year-old, uh, and obese. Uh, this raised the possibility of either a metabolic syndrome or an endocrine uh, problem. So when looking at her face, uh, you can see that the patient had multiple inflammatory papules and the patient had hirsutism. So uh, immediately what we asked the patient is history of any menstrual irregularity. So the patient had irregular menses uh, since puberty and uh, the patient, uh, in addition to her presentation of the acne of the face, she had an androgenic pattern of alopecia, and she had some darkening of the neck and the armpits. So acanthosis nigger camps, uh, endocrine dysfunction, that led us to thinking about a polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, we referred the patient to obstetrics and gynecology, and there they established a diagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, she was put on some treatments uh, from the obstetrics and gynecology side. And from our part, uh, as dermatology, uh, we prescribed uh, spironolactone to this patient. Uh, why does spironolactone help with the treatment of uh, acne? Uh, it is used due to the anti-androgenic effect. It is anti-testosterone and anti-dihydrotestosterone. And as I described in the beginning of the uh, presentation, uh, dihydrotestosterone and testosterone affect the uh, sebaceous function, which causes acne. Uh, so this was the last case that we have. These were my references. And this marks the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now I hand the mic to Dr. Galadari to do this part of the presentation. And I'll see you guys again for the Q&A section. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Uh, thank you all for being here. It's, uh, for, uh, you know, we did not want to complicate things. So we, we decided to find somebody who's got the same name as mine so that, you know, everybody comes in and, you know, you can easily figure out who it is that you're going to be asking questions to. So if you are going to be uh, directing the questions later on to Dr. Hassan, I'm just going to divert them all to Dr. Ashkenani. So that's how it's going to be starting off for me, at least. Uh, so for the beginning of my talk, I'd like to thank uh, you all for being present, all the attendees, and I also like to thank uh, the organizers of Glowderm. It's a wonderful initiative, uh, basically to kind of help, uh, you know, convey uh, what the, you know education in dermatology is truly all about, and, and the sharing of information. So this is extremely important for us, and um, I'd like to thank them uh, truly for, for putting this initiative together and uh, you know, uh, choosing the, the topics that are considered to be quite relevant. And I would say that they're what we call the bread and butter of dermatology. Uh, so the, without further ado, my topic today is a continuation of what uh, Dr. Ashkenani was mentioning. Uh, and we are gonna focus a little bit more on the treatments, however, this time uh, rather than on the clinical cases. Uh, some of them, of course, are, you know, people already know. Some of them would be, they, people would be surprised on like, oh, really? We use it this way? Uh, and then hopefully we are going to end up with a little bit of a short quiz. Um, you know, it, it is, we're very close to Christmas, so maybe you do get a Christmas gift if you do solve uh, the questions all correct. Uh, I promise you, the questions are not really very difficult. So these are my little disclosures. However, there are no conflict of interest for this presentation. The objectives for today is that I'm going to talk a little bit about acne. So, but like I said, a continuation of what Dr. Ashkenani mentioned. I also will discuss the acne algorithm. And uh, this is especially when it comes to the therapeutical aspect of things. For us to truly realize what acne is and how it's treated, we have to come up with a, with a certain algorithm that we can follow, or else we're just going to be completely lost by the sheer number of uh, therapeutic options that we have. Uh, so we're going to do that. Uh, from the uh, acne algorithms, we're going to discuss the topical, the systemic treatments. I'll also mention the chemical peels, the energy-based devices, and finally, I'll end up with diet dietary considerations. So the first things is that we have to kind of divide acne into two different forms. The first one is going to be what we call the non-inflammatory type of acne, and these will include the comedones. You have the blackheads, or what are known as the open comedones and the whiteheads, which are the closed comedones. So that's that's the bit, first way that we would like to divide it. Then the other one is considered to be the inflammatory type of acne. And inflammatory type of acne, you have the papules, the pustules, the nodules, and finally later on ending up with the formation of cysts. So the more inflammation that you get, the more problematic that you can end up having. Uh, of course, the repercussions of the worst case scenario is the formation of uh, secondary lesions that tend up with happening with acne, which, will, which we would consider post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation and unfortunately scarring. Okay, so this is one of the things that we really try to kind of stop formation of when it comes to our therapeutic options of choosing what types of treatments for our acne patients is to truly prevent scarring. Now we have to also understand that everybody who's anybody is going to develop acne. As a matter of fact, one of the uh, major uh, features of pubescence in both males and females is the development of acne lesions. Right? When the basic one is the comedone, it kind of tells you that the person is entering through uh, the uh, pubescent er uh, period of their life, uh, slowly getting into adolescence. Uh, this is how acne usually tends to start off. If you look at uh, the normal hair follicle, because that's what we're looking at, we're looking at the pilosebaceous unit. And as you can see here, due to the effect of follicular hyperkeratinization that ends up happening, we end up formation of a comedone. And that's the basic type of acne. Even though it's considered to be the basic, it is the, probably the most difficult type of acne that is able to be uh, responsive to any type of treatment. And a lot of patients have to be taken into consideration in this aspect. If a comedone is open, so the upper part of the skin uh, is open, you end up with a closed comedone, oh, sorry, a blackhead, which is an open comedone. So as you can see it over here, it's, that's basically it appears black due to the effect of the dry secretions that tend to happen and also the way that the light is reflecting on it. 
if by any chance the components of the uh, you know the formation the, the basically the, the actual you know papule starts coming out you end up with a formation of inflammation and the first thing that you end up seeing is because of the exposure of this keratinous material into the dermis you end up with a formation of inflammation and then you know you have the formation of pustules because that's when the immune system starts taking into consideration and then finally you end up with nodules and cysts and these are common examples as we saw little examples of pictures that you can end up seeing between the comedonal type of acne which is barely visible into the inflammatory type which is usually uh, red hence you know the formation of inflammation that tends to happen you can also have a little bit of mixed and then finally formation of nodular cystic this is what we're trying to kind of prevent we try to prevent the formation of nodular cystic because the, if you look at in terms of percentage wise they're the ones who will cause more scarring to happen even though there have been reported cases of scarring happening also with comedonal type of acne so that's the reason why any patient who comes in with their parents i always instruct and i, I there's the education that happens to the parents more than it happens to the to the children sometimes is that you really have to try to treat acne because a lot of the parents would say hey listen this is a way of life it's just basically something that we're going to be getting and it's just going to go away when a person turns their into their 20s uh, you know or, you know or mid 20s i would say I tell them that is that is true everybody definitely will be getting acne but however if we do become tardy in terms of treatment, even the simplest form of acne, which is the condonal type of acne, can lead to scarring. And this is something that we will try to prevent. So hence the reason why we have to come up with an algorithm of treatment. Without having an algorithm, we basically get lost on how we're going to be treating our acne. Because you don't want to go, for example, with high you know, uh, basically doses of certain antibiotics, say, for example, in a patient with comedonal acne. First, it is not going to work. Second, and there are to be adverse events, for example, the development of resistance and so forth. And, and third, you're basically just wasting money. And this is very, very important. I'm very sensitive when it comes to this. And you'll see a lot of my presentation here, I will also talk a little bit about the cost of treatment because that is something that we have to also convey to our patients. A lot of the treatment options can be a little bit costly and it's very important for us to share the cost uh, or, or the information on cost to our patients so that they have a much better informed or they can make an informed decision when it comes to the treatment of their condition. So this is the, your basic algorithm. If you have mild acne, moderate or severe acne, you would start off with the topical medications first and Dr. Ashkenani mentioned them. You will start off either with the benzoyl parasites, the retinoids, which are your basic ones for that I usually start off with any type of acne first. Then you can add, add the azelaic or combination treatment. If there are no adequate response for mild acne, then you would switch to other forms of topical agents, such as cadapsone, uh, clascoterone, salicylic acid, sulfacetamide, sulfur, and niacinamide. For moderate acne, you can combine now topical or combination with oral. And the one that we tend to start using most of the time are the oral antibiotics. But at the same time, you can also use oral hormonal therapy, especially in females, okay? Uh, and especially if the acne is related to, uh, you know, hormonal influxes. If an inadequate response tends to happen, you can change your topical treatment and add other different uh, treatments. And here you would consider for moderate acne, oral isotretinone. For severe acne, you can do the exact same thing. However, you want to keep into consideration that oral isotretinone becomes also a first choice. And then if an inadequate uh, response tends to happen, you can change your oral uh, hormonal therapy or antibiotics and also consider oral isotretinone. You have to take into consideration though, however, is that there are certain antibiotics that should not be combined with oral isotretinone. As you heard earlier, the tetracyclines have a chance for predisposition to cause an increase in intracranial pressure. Isotretinoin does the exact same thing. So if you combine, you increase the risk of developing a rise in intracranial pressure for patients uh, who are on both of them. So you really try to avoid adding that type or that type of class of antibiotics with uh, the oral isotretinoins. 
So this is another algorithm that a person might want to take into consideration that looks at pretty much the actual formation of acne. So you deal with the comedonal type of acne. And here, the most important one would be a topical retinoid. If they're effective, perfect. You, contain, you continue. And you have to tell the patient that they're going to have to wait at least three to four months for them to get the maximum benefit of these type of medications. Not two weeks. That's a, and that's a problem with our patients because they are impatient. They want things to move a little bit on the faster side. But comedonal acne, as I mentioned earlier, really requires a lot of time. If it's ineffective, then you want to switch to treatments for mild inflammatory pathophysiotomies. You can add, in addition to your topical tret uh, you know, uh, tretinone or retinone, a benzoyl peroxide. If it's effective, fantastic. You continue the exact same thing. If it's not effective, then you might want to consider the treatment of inflammatory papules and pustules. And in this case over here, you want to consider, so you want to see yourself, is this a nodular type of acne? If it's nodular, you may want to consider, in addition to your topical retinoids, that you may want to add other medications, for example, such as you know uh, an oral antibiotic. If it's papules and pustules, and you've already started the patient on topical retinoids, in addition to a benzoyl peroxide and also topical antibiotics, if they're not effective, you switch them to an oral one. If they're effective, you continue. If it's severe inflammatory papules with pustules and papules and also nodules, then you have to, you have to think about the consideration of starting oral isotretinoin. So for me, oral isotretinoin, I would consider to be very much on that list for those type of patients, unless the patient comes to you with just simple papules and pustules, but the formation of scars. The minute I see scars, my threshold for oral isotretinoin goes from here to down here. And I immediately start them off on oral isotretinoin after I educate them. Because if you have the formation of scars, the only one that's gonna salvage things is going to be your oral isotretinoin. So it's very important for us to keep that in mind because scarring is like diamonds. You know, it lasts forever. And what happens basically is that you're going to ask your patients to come back and see you a little bit later on for the treatment of their acne scars. And truly, it never goes back to baseline. They will always have some form of scarring even through adulthood. So it's much better to prevent those scarring from happening than to actually treat them later on. Let's talk a little bit about the topical medications first. First of all, benzoyl peroxide. The way that it works, it's an antimicrobial effect. The good thing about it, the way that it works is that due to the effect of oxidation that tends to happen, the formation of free radicals that tends to end up in the bacteria, it kills off the bacteria. And it also does not cause any resistance because it doesn't work pretty much on a certain bacterial strain. What, like I said, mentioned it, it causes the release of these free radicals inside the bacteria that basically kind of zonks them out and blows them into smithereens. So benzoyl peroxide is the way that is the way to go if you want to choose, for example, an initial antimicrobial. It does, however, cause irritation and bleaching of the skin, not only of the skin, of the sheets also. So if you see me wearing black, if I have benzoyl peroxide on my face and I wipe my clothes on this, it's definitely going to bleach it. So you want to be careful, especially when it comes to kids. You tell your parents. Uh, that you'll want to be careful not for them to wear or use, for example, colored towels, because what's going to happen is that it is going to bleach those towels or be bleach those colors. Retinoids. For me, those are the, considered to be the first line treatment of any form of type of acne in the beginning, but they are in terms of consideration comedolytic. It, they will cause photosensitivity of certain individuals, so you want to be very careful, especially during the summertime. And then, you know, the rate limiting step on basically using them is the irritation that they tend to cause. And the irritation tends to get a little bit better with time. So you tell the patient it will get better after the third or fourth week. And you start them off very slowly, and then you basically, you reach up to a certain point in which the irritation is going to be quite, you know, it's going to be okay. And you can combine, for example, a moisturizer. You tell the patient, apply a moisturizer first, and then apply basically your retinoid so it helps in a, in, a, in a sense and at the same time you can also do short contact meaning you tell the patient apply the you know the, the retinoid for just about an hour and just remove it after that and short contact has been shown that to have some form of efficacy for certain patients antibiotics you have the topical antibiotics erythromycin and clindamycin they can have an my, both microbial and anti-inflammatory effect however they, they, they can develop resistance as oleic acid was mentioned earlier, it has a modest clinical effect, but it works in a nice way that it's kind of also can help with your post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. 
Dapsone, nobody really knows how it works. Could be due to the effect of its anti-inflammatory effect through the function of the neutrophils, because it definitely is an anti-neutrophil. However, it has no effect on comedonal acne because comedonal acne, as we mentioned, is not inflammatory. So let's look at the cost here. And also let's look at the pregnancy category because that's also very important for your patients. The, uh, if you look at azelaic acid, it is the, it is the only one that would, that would be considered as category B in terms of topical medications. So this you can actually give to patients who are uh, planning on getting pregnant or who are pregnant. The cost, as you can see here, is about nearly $200. Benzoyl peroxide is actually very, very cheap. And this is, the, like I said, it's considered to be one of the first line of treatments for our patients. It's about $5 over the counter, and it is over the counter. And if it's a prescription strength, which I would not recommend because even though prescription strength is considered to be a little bit stronger, it causes a little bit more irritation. Dapson, as you see, is a little bit more on the pricier side. Salicylic acid is uh, also considered to be very, very cheap. However, the ones that are found over the counter is actually very mild in that aspect. Then you end up with the retinoids, the topical retinoids. Uh, with the ones that are available, the tretinone and adapalene are category C. The only one that's category X is tazarotene. And as you can see here in terms of the price, uh, the older generation one, which is the tretinone, is considered to be on the cheaper side. So it, it, I would start that off first. Adapalene, which causes less irritation to happen, is a little bit pricier, even though now adapalene is also available over the counter in certain uh, certain locations. And tazarotene is actually pretty pricey, and tazarotene is a category X. Topical antibiotics, you have the clindamycin and the erythromycin, both of them are category B. And you can see here in terms of the uh, uh, resist, sorry, in terms of the cost, it, it's cheaper. The erythromycin is slightly cheaper, than that, but that's because it's more resistance. There's more resistance reported with erythromycin than the clindamycin slightly more expensive. So these are the topical medications, and we're going to move on to the systemic medications. The first ones, of course, are the oral antibiotics, and there are many. You have the tetracyclines, which are the most commonly used, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, also known as Bactrim, which is TNP-SMX, trimethoprim alone, macrolide, which is zithromycin can be used, and cephalexin. They're very highly effective for inflammatory acne. So they have an effect on inflammation in addition to an antibiotic effect. Okay, as I mentioned, they're of low cost, ease of administration, and excellent safety profile. The major problem that ends up happening with the, in the tetracyclines usually is a little bit of, you know, gastric upset. You tell the patient to drink, a, you know, gobble up a glass of water, and they'll be more than okay. And and also to avoid basically lying, you know, um, you know, still, uh, you know, up, or onto their sides basically uh, for a period of about a couple of hours, so that it doesn't cause any irritation to the stomach or the esophagus. So tetracyclines tetracyclines are considered to be the first line. Macrolides may be used if tetracyclines cannot be used. And there are certain age groups we don't give tetracyclines, for example, under the age of eight because they have not formed their teeth yet. We can't give tetracyclines and we have to think about giving them the macrolides. So that's when we uh, usually tend to do that. And so erythromycin, which is a macrolide, I would not give because resistance is pretty much high uh, worldwide with that agent. Azithromycin is the one that tends given in most circumstances. And you can pulse dose it, three dose four days a month with good efficacy and studies that have been published. And how it kind of looks like, and you can look at the cost on the, on the size there. You end up with the uh, tetracycline, which will include doxycycline as a tetracycline, and minocycline as a tetracycline. And you can end up choosing which one is the best. And for, you know, if you think about them, uh, tetracycline, which, which is your first line, is, is your, as a category C, so you would want to give that, you can give that uh, for certain individuals. It's the least cost, uh, costly effect. Uh, the dosing is usually about once or twice a day. The doxy and the minnow has a little bit better safety profile in terms of the uh, adverse events that they tend to cause. Uh, and in terms of the cost, they're slightly more expensive. Minocycline can also lead to uh, pigmentation. So keep that in, uh, in mind because there's a lot of minocycline related pigmentation that ends up happening with patients with acne. So you wanna keep that into consideration up in addition to the adverse events that are listed over there. Erythromycin, which is a macrolide, causes stomach upset to happen. Uh, Trimethoprim cephalopentacetra can cause allergic reactions to the point that they can actually lead to uh, certain uh, very, very bad ones, such as, you know, uh, Stevens Johnson and so forth. So you want to try to avoid them in certain individuals. Resistance is a 
big, big concern when it comes to antibiotics because if patients are on topical or oral antibiotics, there is a resulting of about threefold increase in strep pyogenes colonization in the oropharynx. And long-term use of certain of these agents can increase respiratory, upper respiratory infections, multi-drug resistant glycemic index flora and staph aureus colonization. So it's very important. Thus, the CDC came up with a consensus guideline that these antibiotics can be given to about a minimum of six to eight weeks. And you do not want to go beyond basically any, you know, beyond that. So three to six months is if necessary. And to just continue if you don't see any results after 12 weeks. And you also treatment of relapse with the same antibiotics is going to be effective. So don't switch them to another antibiotic. The person is, has been on antibiotics before, they responded, bring them back on the same one. Consider antimicrobial dose of doxycycline, meaning what I mentioned, uh, don't go with the full therapeutic effect. There is the low dose basically of, uh, that they can be used for the, inflama the inflammatory aspect and avoid basically monotherapy uh, with oral antibiotics. Try to combine them with your topical retinoids or your benzoyl peroxide. Don't combine them with a topical antibiotic. You don't wanna give an oral antibiotic a topical antibiotic. So these are the CDC guidelines. The AAD came back and said that there is a subset of patients that may require them to take a little bit more than the actual uh, set uh, that, that was done by the CDC. Okay, so that's basically what you wanna do. Retinoids, retinoids, isotretinoin for me is, is pretty much the gold standard for patients who have really severe nodular cystic hypervacne. And as Dr. Ashkanani mentioned, it follows a cumulative dose about 120 to 150 milligrams per kilogram. And you can go all the way up to 220 milligrams per kilograms with certain individuals so that it lowers the rate of relapse. Because relapse can happen, nearly about 40% of patients are going to relapse with just one course and would require another one. The most common adverse events, of course, is dryness. Okay, so xerosis is pretty high on the list. Chelitis, because also dryness, dry eyes, and also myalgias. Less common side effects will include depression. And depression has gotten a bad, isotretinoin has gotten a bad rap because of this. A cohort of studies that looked at nearly 440,000 patients treated with isotretinoin reported actually lower rates of suicide. Okay, that then the patients who are with, you know, then the patients who are in the general population who did not take isotretinone. And the reason for this is that probably it could be that patients who have acne are slightly more suicidal. And patients who are having their acne treated get a little bit better. And that's the reason why depression is still controversial in that aspect. I personally, I would talk to my patients, maybe mention this with the parents, also with the patient to ask them if the mood goes on. But at the same time, you don't want it to be to suggest that to your patient because if you tell them, oh, you may be depressed with this pill, trust me, they are going to be depressed. Okay. So because of that suggestibility that they may be getting. Keep an eye on it, but it's not really, I think it's not in a bad rap because of this. Inflammatory bowel disease, there are several studies that meta-analysis have not found any association between it and isotretinol. Hormonal therapies come in as important and a meta-analysis of 32 randomized control trials looked at this, and there are a number of them that tend to be used, uh, and as you, they're mentioned here. And finally, you also have spironolactone, which is considered to be a hormonal therapy, even though it is not an oral contraceptive pill, okay? It is a diuretic that is, has an anti-androgenic effect, and it's commonly used in adult women with PCOS, but it's very, very effective and has similar efficacy to oral antibiotics. I'd like to talk a little bit about chemical peels. And the first chemical peel that was first made, it was done in the ancient Egyptians. And this is Cleopatra, who used to fill her bath up with pretty much sour milk. And because of the defect of lactic acid, was able to kind of remove the dead skin and exfoliate her skin. So chemical peels do tend to work. And these are the list of all the different chemical peels that are out there. And some of them that are used for acne. The most commonly used ones will include the glycolic, the salicylic, and jesners or even though TCA has also been used. A meta-analysis that looked at all of this through a systematic literature review, looked at all the different types of peels and whether they function or whether they work or not. For example, a TCA versus salicylic acid, both of them did work, they definitely showed improvement. Salicylic acids versus phototherapy also did work. Salicylic acid versus Jesner's peel also showed some efficacy. Salicylic acid, in addition to mandelic acid versus glycolic acid, also works. Salicylic, salicylic acid versus pyruvic acid also works. Glycolic acid versus placebo 
there were more responsive people with the glycolic acid rather than when compared to placebo. Glycolic acid versus salicylic, which is which I found very, very interesting here. So it's a 30% glycolic and a 30% salicylic. What they found is that the glycolic people actually did a little bit better than the salicylic ones. The glycolic acid versus Jesner's. Glycolic acid, this is a high glycolic acid one, which is about 70%. And three sessions also showed uh, efficacy versus Jesner's. And then, you know, we look at uh, a peel versus a laser, and you saw that uh, in a, if you basically look at the differences, that a 25% TCA peel was also very com much comparable to a pulse dye laser. So chemical peels are quite effective for mild to moderate acne. There is limited evidence, however, there, you know, and no, nothing that we can actually be drawn in terms of superiority with other types of uh, treatments. However, my recommendation here is for us to be very much informed as using it as an adjunct rather than a major treatment. I don't usually start off my patients with chemical peels and tell them this is the only way to go. It has to be combined with other topical medications that they tend to use. And if you look at the different types of uh, pricing, as I mentioned, I'm very sensitive about to this. And you can see here that superficial peels such as glycolic and salicylic peels are actually quite uh, cheap. They're not, they're, not, uh, they're not expensive as compared to other uh, forms of treatment. Energy-based devices, and these are what we call lasers, or what people want to call lasers. There are two forms that have been shown efficacy. There's blue light and red light. The blue light is the one that has been getting most of the immediate attention because it, what it does is it can, uh, it is absorbed by the uh, acne-causing bacteria and causes free radicals, which causes damage to the cells and basically kind of dies away. So at a Cochrane Systematic Literature Review, by uh, the following individuals that they found that photodynamic therapy, there was no evidence to support that it is with blue light, that it was superior than your regular run of the mill topical medications. Light-based therapy due to the effect of a heterogeneous nature of the studies showed weak evidence. So there is no clinical significance comparing all the different types of light. And there were several studies that looked at blue light versus clindamycin, blue light versus isotretinoin, Inter, uh, IPL intense pulse light versus BPO, PDL versus also BPO, and all of them, according to head to head, there were no significant differences. The major difference was through cost. Energy based devices are actually quite expensive, okay, as compared to the other normal regimens. So you have to keep that into consideration, all right? So, especially patients who are very sensitive to that area. Uh, there was just a recent article, uh, just recently, this was when I say recent, this was like just yesterday. <laughs> Uh, that showed that the use of a 1762 laser actually also was quite effective. And it has just recently been approved. So this is hot off the presses. You're hearing it from me. I just looked at the press release yesterday and uh, the FDA uh, just recently approved a 1762 laser for the treatment of acne. So which is a, a great thing as an adjunct. All right. So dietary considerations very quickly here. It is controversial. The most current framework suggests it's due to the effect of the glycemic index, leads to hyperinsulinemia, and increasing an insulin growth factor one. It thus exacerbates keratinocyte proliferation. Elevated IGF has also shown to augment the antiandrogen uh, release. So other studies look at dairy products, and from all of them, uh, a whole fat milk actually causes less problems for us to happen, okay? If you want to compare it, for example, to skim milk. So skim milk, mainly through its components of casein and whey, actually will cause more problems for you if you, ha if you have an acne-prone skin. So if anybody who's listening, because we use casein and whey a lot for uh, protein shakes, okay, just be in the consideration that there is a higher predisposition for you to develop acne if you do have that, if you take, take too much of it. Okay, so you want to keep that into consideration here for those who uh, basically work out and they are pretty much in love with protein shakes, such as myself. All right, so a literature review also looked at metformin for the use of acne. And in three trials, those that level of evidence that showed that their people with metformin had a greater reduction of total lesions, especially inflammatory ones, than the control ones. So in conclusions, assess your patients thoroughly. It's very, very important. Personalized treatment based on gender, social consideration, and financial burden. I can't really stress that enough. Be sensitive to when to start systemic th therapy. Patient is developing scarring, start it away. Make sure you have a plan ahead. 
and you tell the patient what your plan is and, and keep them informed, keep them engaged. We're going to start off with step one, then we have step two, and then we have step three. And if we need, we can always create a step four. This way, patients feel hope that there is hope for them. And at the same time, they also feel they realize that you have, you know, basically your eye on the ball and you'll be able to kind of take care of things uh, as, uh, as their condition progresses. Combine treatments. Don't be afraid to combine and educate patients and realize their fears. A lot of patients are really scared about like certain things that they might want to take. For example, isotretinoin. They will be like, oh my God, I'm going to take isotretinoin. When can I get pregnant? If you are on isotretinoin and you want to get pregnant, you just have to wait one month and then you get pregnant. Okay, it's completely okay because that's what they're afraid of. A lot of, you know, I have a lot of parents come to me and they tell me like, oh, you know, we're afraid that, you know, if she gets pregnant right now, what's going to happen? Uh, especially in our culture, you know, a person can get uh, asked for marriage very, very quickly and all of a sudden very spontaneously. And she says yes, but she's on oral isotretinol. Imagine telling the, your in-laws, well, you know, she can't be married because she has to finish her course of oral isotretinol. And, you know, a lot of doctors tell them, oh, you have to wait about six to nine months. That is completely false. Tell them one month. That's very, very important to realize their fears and assess them and educate your patients. So these are my little references for today's talk. I do have a few MCQs that I'm going to be sharing with you, and you can basically uh, answer them through the chat. Uh, first ones, I don't know if you guys want to do the uh, question and answers first before we go through the MCQs. Um, so I'm going to ask the organizers if they're okay with that. I don't... Uh, you can go through the MCQs first. All right, so the first question, an easy one. Oh, sorry, uh, well, not what time. What type of milk has been shown to cause the least effect on sebum production? Is it skimmed, soy, almond, whole milk, or reduced fat milk? And the answer would be, remember, the, the question is least effect, least. Are they putting it in the chat? We have a, a one coming in, a two, four, yeah, four, skim, one. Got a mix of answers here. Another um, couple for one skim. Okay. So, well, so the ones, twos, and fours. So some ones and some uh, some whole. So the answer here is actually whole milk. Okay, so whole milk does not cause uh, the sebum production. Skim milk causes causes it through the effect of its components, casein and whey. Uh, soy and almond. I mean, I don't want to cause any or stir any troubles here, but I don't know what kind of milk that is in terms of the way that it's uh, that it's actually kind of uh, named but it has not been associated with that aspect of it. But it, the studies have shown that whole milk is better to consume if you are gonna be taking dairy products. The second question is, what type of topical agent used for acne has not yet shown any antibiotic resistance? That should be an easy one. Have a three. Three benzyl peroxide. Three. There's a one. Mostly threes coming in here. Good, good. And and the and the answer is correct. The answer is three benzyl peroxide has not been shown to have any antibi antimicrobial or antibiotic resistance. Hence, the reason why it may be used for patients who are taking oral antibiotics, so that they can use a topical uh, benzyl peroxide. Now, which uh, type of peel has a stronger predilection to work on oil production? Uh, is it glycolic, Jesner's, TCA, salicylic, and lactic? So one of them works pretty much more on the actual, uh, you know, oily faces. And I see a lot of fours that are coming in. And, and that is correct. The correct answer is salicylic acid. You're absolutely correct. Glycolic acid is mainly used for patients who have dry skin so or sensitive skin, but they do have acne. Salicylic acid, because it's lipophilic, has a, works very well in terms of working on uh, patients with oily skin because the body just simply absorbs the, uh, the sebaceous glands actually absorbs the salicylic acid. 
All right, uh, which anti-androgen used in acne is also used as a diuretic? This is straightforward. Very good, very good. People, all right. So the, the correct answer is spironolactone, and both both myself and Dr. Ashkenani mentioned spironolactone uh, as, as, as an anti-androgen uh, that is also a diuretic. Remember, this is a potassium uh, sparing diuretic, so you want to make sure that uh, patients don't take extra uh, potassium, especially in the form of, for example, of bananas, or that they're taking, for example, uh, you know, potassium supplementation. So you want to keep that into consideration because they do develop hyperkalemia. Uh, at certain uh, times. Uh, which one is considered to be a non-inflammatory uh, form of acne? This is like, we're going basics here, folks. And that, that is correct. From one to four, all of them are considered to be inflammatory type of acne. The last one, which is a comedonal acne, which is your basic form of acne, is considered to be uh, your, your non-inflammatory one. And the last question, I had to put this down together because I really tried to stress uh, upon it a little bit more at the end. When can you advise a woman to get pregnant if she is on systemic isopretinone? The next day, a month, three months, six months, or a year? Oh, wow. Somebody actually put a year down? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> All right. That's... And the, and the correct answer is one month. You're absolutely correct. Most studies shown that the byproducts of isotretinone or the metabolites are removed anywhere between 10 to 18 days in our system. But however, we don't tell our patients wait 18 days. We round it off to the larger number. In this case over here, it makes it easier for us to say a month. So you, that, this say, you make sure that the patient is completely off the medication and that it's completely out of their system. So you tell them to wait uh, for a month for them to get this. And with this, I'd like to thank you all for your kind attention. And I would like to open it for questions if they do have any questions and uh, we'll take it from there. I'm gonna stop mm -hmm. sharing my screen here. Go. Perfect. Thank you both so much for that amazing talk. There are some questions in the Q&A, so I'll get started. Um, the first question was, can you combine spironolactone with isotretinoin? Uh, that is a good question. And the answer is yes. Yes, you may. You can definitely combine both of them together if you feel like you feel that you want to do that. Uh, you can combine uh, any oral contraceptive pill also with uh, isotretinoin. As a matter of fact, that's how it's usually given. We give the, uh, the pill in addition to isotretinoin. For certain parts of the world, like for example, in the West, they, uh, they have to, you have to do that together or else you can't even prescribe isotretinoin. So combining spironolactone with isotretinoin is completely okay. Great, thank you so much. Okay, the next question is, um, this is for Dr. Galadari. Can we use a combination of chemical peels and lasers on the same days as an adjunct therapy for moderate to severe acne? Well, both at the same time, I would really try to avoid is because the lasers themselves, the, the peels will sensitize and oversensitize the patient to the actual laser. So if you do both at the same time, it definitely kind of counteracts their, their effect. So I would not recommend doing that. Now, there are certain types of, you know, for patients, for example, uh, and certain types of lasers in which would work, for example, on the papular form of acne and, you know, and they just hit it off with just on, the, on those papules, you could use that and then you can basically apply the peel all over the face to have more of a field effect. But it's the laser first or the light first, because it's an, it is technically an intense pulse light, followed by the actual peel, not the other way around. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is, what is the complication of any of isotretinoin in men for short or the long term? Uh, the, so it has, it, that, that's an interesting question. So it has not been shown to cause any teratogenicity, uh, but it has been, uh, the, the levels of isotretinone can also be found in the semen. So it has been looked at, uh, but it had no teratogenic effect. So for me, at least, I don't usually tell my patients that they need to stop it if they feel on conceiving. So it's completely okay in that aspect. So they really don't have to stop their medications for it. It's the woman who would have to do that. Um, 
There was, um, yeah, so just to, there was actually a question hopping over to the chat. So any restrictions on males for trying to conceive while isotret, on isotret, no. And so it sounds like no. Okay. Um, and then the next question is, are there any vitamins that can cause or worsen acne? Yes. So there's one vitamin that is really bad. And this is the vitamin that's actually found in a lot of our energy drinks, which is vitamin B6. Okay, so taking a high dose of vitamin B6 can actually worsen your acne. So apart from the fact that it has a lot of sugar and will increase your glycemic index, but because of the effect of vitamin B6, and you see the vitamin B6 that's there is like more than like 300 or 400 percent the, the, the you know the required dietary allowance for that day. So uh, at this case here, I would try to avoid uh, vitamin B6 for certain individuals. Great. Um, this question says, what, what about the use of other systemic tretinoins apart from isotretinoin? I would not recommend doing that. Acetretinoin, so the uh, only one that you can actually conceive after about a year, I'm oh, sorry, about, after about a month is isotretinoin. The other ones, for example, atretinate and acetretin, you're going to have to wait for a long period of time. Uh, my, you know, for the acetretin, I believe you have to wait uh, for about a few, six to 12 months and at retinate, you have to wait a couple of years. So it's a long period of time for them to actually be on it, especially if they're mixed with alcohol. So uh, I would not recommend using any of the other isopretinones. Okay. Um, the next question is, what is the best time to take isotretinoin? I'm not sure if this is referring to when with, is the best time to start food. or the time frame. Take, take it with food. That's the best way because it, 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 the body absorbs it better. Perfect. Um, there was a, just a mention on here of uh, fungal acne. I don't know if there's any brief comments. I'm sure that's a whole topic in itself, but it just uh, says um, yeah. fungal acne as I mentioned. There, there's fungal it's, it's, folliculitis, but it's, I've never heard of fungal acne. Yeah, it's, it's fungal folliculitis, but it's commonly, like some people call it fungal acne. It's basically just an infection with uh, malassezia, just affecting the follicles. But some people refer to it as fungal acne, but it's an entirely different condition. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, what is your opinion on the combination of microdermabrasion and chemical peeling um, or chemabrasion in acne? Uh, my opinion on microdermabrasion and chemical peeling? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the, I would consider them to be more of an adjunct. You have to be very careful when it comes to microdermabrasion if the, if the patient is getting peeled or the patient is on tretinone. Their, their skin is going to be quite sensitive to any of those uh, types of treatments. And you may actually cause more trauma to it, which can actually cause, you know, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation and, you know, uh, scarring can also develop. So you want to be very careful if you want to kind of have that as part of your acne regimen. Now, if you do, it's completely okay, but just make sure that they stop their topical agents about three or five days even prior to uh, having that procedure performed on them. Wonderful. Um, just a couple more questions. Um, sometimes after completing the course of isotretinoin for certain patients, they'll have great results, but then after two to three years, the acne will return. Um, what's the next option for such a patient? Is, is for them to go back on isotretinoin again. I mean, you know, it's as I mentioned, the, the rate of relapse is actually quite high. 40% is not, is not a very small rate. Uh, so if it worked for them initially, you can definitely start them off on again. Now, if they are not ready to start them off on those type of medications, for example, oral isotretinoin, if it's a woman and it's hormonal type of acne, you may want to consider using hormonal uh, therapy for her. So it depends on uh, what type of acne that they develop, but feel free to start them off on oral isotretinoin again. That makes sense. Um, this is for Dr. Ashkenani regarding his case illustration of the patient who was on isotretinoin for nine months. Um, okay. Do you use a combination with topicals or a moisturizer? Uh, for this patient, uh, we initially started her only on our isotretinoin. Uh, it was just, just, just use isotretinoin daily and moisturize. And we were considering uh, lowering the dose of isotretinoin and adding spironolactone, but this mm -hmm. patient did not need it as she was greatly improving with a monotherapy with isotretinoin. But as I said, uh, moisturizers, lip balms, and eye drops. Okay. Every patient, okay. yeah. 
And then the last uh, Q and A in the chat we have right now is, what is the use of laser for post-inflammatory post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, when can it be considered and which product uh, would you use after using uh, the Pico laser? So th these are, you know, repercussions of your acne treatment, uh, so of your acne. So if they do have that, then you might want to consider uh, lasers. But if a patient has active acne, I would not, I would highly recommend not using any type of laser. The heat of the laser that is caused by the machine can actually stimulate your acne from getting even worse. So I would not do it at the same time as the patient is being treated uh, with, you know, for acne. I wanna make sure that all the you know, active acne lesions are gone and then, and then basically start them off uh, for the treatment of post implants or hyperpigmentation if I'm using an energy-based device. Great. Um, those are all the Q&As we have in the chat uh, right now. Let's double check. I want to thank everybody for participating. We have a lot of um, messages in the chat about how excellent the presentation was. And we learned, I learned a lot as well. So I wanted to just thank both of our speakers again. Um, and if there's no other questions, uh, we can go ahead and close out the session. And thank you both again so much. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Have a nice day. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.